Winnipeg Jets fans, I'm so excited and I just can't hide it. We have had two first round picks in the 2022 NHL entry draft, and let's just say they're pretty interesting. One of them was a very swing for the fences pick, and another was actually probably another kind of swing for the fences pick, uh, although you wouldn't really guess where both were taken. We'll talk about who these prospects are, what they bring to the team, and my thoughts on uh, both their chances of making the NHL and also uh, some of the bigger surprises of the draft as a whole, especially in this first round. All coming right up on tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets. Or Locked On, the Hockey Jets, your daily podcast on the Winnipeg Jets. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends, and welcome to this episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Harrison Lee, an avid Winnipeg Jets fan and an online blogger. You can follow me on Twitter at HLLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. Thank you for choosing to make Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. If you enjoy what you're hearing, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform of choice, including Apple, Spotify, Google, Megaphone, Odyssey, and YouTube. Doing so is completely free of charge and ensures you never miss another episode. But most of all, we just really love and appreciate your support. Uh, on tonight's episode, of course, we are talking about my reactions to Winnipeg's first uh, first round picks. Obviously, the rest of the draft is going to be occurring um, later on, on Friday, starting at around, I believe, 11 a.m. Eastern. So uh, a couple of hours after you are probably listening to this podcast. Uh, so this is going to, I guess, be a little bit of a fun teaser, I suppose. And we'll also give some thoughts later in this episode on the rest of the first round. Obviously, a pretty surprising one overall. A lot of craziness. But first, let's focus on the Jets. So Winnipeg drafted two very interesting players that I think exist on opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of what you think uh, a drafted prospect might look like. At 14th overall, Winnipeg kind of took a lot of people by surprise, myself included, and drafted um Rutger McGrory from, I believe, the U.S. National uh, Team Development Program, which is an interesting one, right? Rutger, I think, was probably one of the most divisive picks uh, in this first round in the range that it was taken, in part because in in isolation, the pick itself wouldn't normally be that much of a reach. McGrory was sort of someone considered to be, I don't know, anywhere in the 20 to 25 range. But when you really think about it, uh, especially with how pick values tend to work and how the rankings were this year, he probably could have gone mid-teens and it would have been relatively within reason, right? So it's not the biggest reach, but for me personally, when the, when the pick was announced, I was kind of like, oh, um, taking a little bit of back, right? Bit of a surprise, wasn't really thrilled with it because uh, Jonathan uh, Lekedemaki and, uh, of course, well, Joachim Kamel were both available, which I was thinking... Either one of these Finnish skaters would have been really good uh, prospects for the Jets to draft. I was really hyped for one of them to fall to the Jets. The fact that both were on the board when Winnipeg could have uh, made the selection for me was like, oh, wow, this is like a layup, a bang, bang option. Uh, Kamel was one of the top 10 ranked prospects. The Katamaki basically right in the same range. Either one would have been amazing. Um, so when Rutger McGrory got announced, I was kind of like, Oh, you know, a little bit surprised. McGrory is a very interesting case because he's maybe one of the worst skaters in the entire draft class. And oftentimes what you find with prospects who maybe aren't so fleet of foot or have very serious mechanical issues in their skating is that, yeah, you, you, you can work on it, right? I think Cole Perfetti is a very good example. Uh, Paul Stastny, another guy. Braden Point, I believe, used to be a pretty bad skater, or or maybe it was uh, Nikita Kucherov. I think a, a number of Tampa players have had this problem. Um, maybe both Point and Kucherov had some issues, and it took a little bit to kind of work with them. Kucherov has kind of found ways to work around it. I think Point skating in general now is just really good. Uh, but whatever the case may be, whether it was Kucherov, Point, or both that had really rough mechanics, Obviously, you can work and kind of massage it and sort of develop those those strides, improve the technique and, and work on, you know, um, different crossovers and stuff. But what's interesting with McGrory is that 
despite his mechanics, which are quite frankly pretty pretty rough, uh, maybe one of the worst skating mechanics from a raw perspective that I've seen in a top round prospect, he still just racked up a lot of points for the U.S. Now, I think that there's a decent argument that, you know, part of it might be the environment that he's playing in, right? You know, he's a really big kid, a very strong power forward, and he's playing on a pretty good program against a lot of different opponents, some of which are not going to have the same talent level that the national development team program is going to be able to field. But um, all that said, what I've noticed from footage with McGordy is that he's very smart. He knows where he needs to be. He's got a great shot. His passing and vision are all there. His spatial awareness looks to be pretty darn good. And so for me, I think everything about his offensive style and how he approaches the game to me checks off the boxes for what you look for in a middle to, middle to top six prospect. I, I think that his ceiling is definitely going to be capped because he's not super mobile. Uh, you know, that, that skating is, look, I'm going to be honest, the stride is really choppy, inefficient and heavy but he himself has indicated that he knows it. And, you know, he's actually working with a phenomenal skating instructor in Barb Underhill. Of course, she was an amazing figure skater in her prime, and she's been working with Toronto and Tampa Bay in an advisory role. And, and you know, as a skating coach, recently stepped away from both teams, but it looks like she has done some private coaching now. And if anyone can help McGordy kind of find his stride and become an NHLer, it does seem like Underhill really could, couldn't be a better choice, right? I think Barb has all of the skills and tool sets to make him uh, one of the best, I guess, risers in terms of like improvements to his mechanics because he's starting from a really rough spot, right? It's clear that his stride definitely needs work. Um, there's a lot of fundamental issues with his mechanics, some of which I probably don't even recognize, but that she would because, again, she's an expert in this. She's worked with a lot of really talented NHLers um, and helped them you know, make the league. So. Yeah, I, I think that this pick, look, it is a bit of a reach considering who else was on the board, but if McRory is able to become at least an NHL, like an NHL average skater in terms of his ability, I think that there is a genuinely exciting prospect here. Again, he is kind of a project, and that's why at 14th overall, I was a little bit uh, skeptical of the pick myself. I thought, you know, this is a guy who I wouldn't really uh, swing for the fences for at 14th overall. He probably would have gone somewhere in the 20 to 25 range as he was expected to. Uh, but, you know, the Jets, maybe they just felt like he was, you know, possibly going to get swooped up by another team. And honestly, when you see his interviews and, and the excitement that he showed when he got drafted, it's just impossible not to already love the kid. He seemed so excited. He had like this bouncy presence and energy that was just super infectious. Um, it rem reminded me a lot of Dylan Sandberg when he first got drafted. Sandberg was a little more reserved, but he had that star starry-eyed, youthful exuberance. And uh, so far, it seems McGordy has that same kind of thing. So if nothing else, in terms of like a character and personality, I think he's going to be a really fun kid to have around this team. And I, I just really want him to pan out. He seems super nice. His energy was just so bubbly and enthusiastic. And, uh, you know, he's got tons of offensive skills. So if he can just work on the skating, and it sounds like he already is and trying to improve it, you know, there there is a real chance that he makes the league one day and might even be a pretty darn good player for the Jets. Now, of course, Winnipeg also had one other pick in the first round, and he probably couldn't be more different to McGroidy's profile. We'll talk about who this prospect is and why I was like super excited, literally over the moon on this one in just a little bit. But before we go any further, I don't want to shout out our wonderful partners at betonline.net. If you've heard me talk about bet online before, you know that uh, I'm not really a big online better myself. I don't do it very often. And when I use bet online, this was actually the first time I'd ever used it for like any sort of online betting on sports. But they made it super easy. They made it super convenient, easy to understand. And like even for a newbie like me who had no idea what I was doing, their website was laid out in a very clean, uh, very controlled format. And it made the process of understanding what you're you're betting on and what you can expect back in return you know, extremely straightforward. What's great about, about Bet Online, though, is that they're not just a betting site. They've got all sorts of information, including podcasts, news, and updates about all of your latest and greatest in your favorite sports, whether you're into auto racing, horse racing, MLB baseball. Uh, of course, they've had like Stanley Cup finals coverage, everything in between. You know, if you're into F1, whatever sport you love, they've probably got you covered. I've, I've personally placed a bet on German soccer, which 
I didn't really expect to see there, but sure enough, there was. Um, but, you know, they've also got live scores, wagering information, esports, and so much more. If you're not at any of that, they've also got Vegas casino games, making sure that all of their bases are covered, and so are you. To get started, it's really easy. Just register for a free account at betonline.net using your laptop or mobile device because BetOnline is where the game starts. Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked on Winnipeg Jets. We are continuing our discussion of Winnipeg's very exciting first round of draft picks. I say exciting because uh, this is the first time that Winnipeg has had more than one pick. Uh, Actually, they just don't even have that many first round picks to begin with uh, in the last couple of years. But um, having two in a round is always very interesting, right? It allows you to swing for the fences on at least one prospect. And with how this draft was, you know, swinging definitely was a, a good option. Before we talk about who they went for, uh, you know, the full yard on this on this pick, I do want to say thanks again for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. Again, as always, we just really love and appreciate your support. And uh, yeah, speaking of support and, and fun things, at 30th overall, the Jets took a huge swing uh, on the fun train and took Brad Lambert. If you've listened to any of my other podcasts, you know that like as soon as they announced that name, I I tried not to shout out loud, but I was super unbelievably excited. Brad Lambert, for me, might just be one of the most dynamic offensive forces in the entire draft. This kid at one point was hyped as maybe even a top one or top two pick. Obviously, over the past couple of months um, and the last year or so, his star and shine has definitely fallen off. Uh, You know, his scoring really plummeted in Liga. And there were serious questions about, you know, his off ice uh, or not like, you know, off the puck dedication and movement and commitment to his shifts. And some of that is definitely valid. And there are also elements of his game that I think are are problems, like the decision making under pressure, sometimes not so great. Uh, And you did see some, you know, kind of sloppy turnovers here and there. I think what people really missed, though, was that when he went from Yvascula to the Lati Pelicans, suddenly his team just drastically changed in quality. I saw some stuff from the footage that Scouching has pulled and some other highlights from other scouts who have posted their findings on YouTube. Uh, You know, the Pelicans are a bad team. I'm going to be honest. Some of the stuff that they were doing was just, I I can't believe that anyone would try this at a professional hockey level. And what I noticed with Brad was that he was trying to do a lot, sometimes a little bit too much, and oftentimes he was very isolated. Lottie skaters on his line would kind of drift around a bit and not really open themselves up into good space. And so like any opponent that Lottie was playing against, if if Brad was on the ice, he was getting surrounded by two, three, even four opponents. And that would often lead to him getting pressure, turning it over, trying to force a pass. And a lot of times his teammates weren't even in really good positions to even receive passes. I think Brad was processing the game ahead of his teammates. And so like when you look at his poor com- uh, completion percentage on his passes, I think that that actually does play a a pretty decent-sized role in it. Does it explain everything that happened with his game? Absolutely not. I think there are some legitimate concerns. But that's the bad stuff, right? I think where you're going to be really excited is that when it comes to skaters and puck handling, uh, edge work, elite offensive talent, Lambert is genuinely one of the most raw, um, like pure, raw, talented prospects in the entire draft. He has so much individual talent and skill and technique that the fact that he fell to the Jets at 30th is basically a crime. I think that he has one of the highest ceilings of any of the players taken this year. I've been a big believer in him for a long time. You know, when this draft class, even before I started looking it up, his name was one of the first that I recognized. And ever since I just saw him carving it up for Finland, I was just kind of sold on him, but I never thought that he would fall to the Jets because, again, second overall, Winnipeg not really tanking. Um, I thought that he was out of reach. And when he started slipping and he fell to Winnipeg and the Jets actually drafted him, I was just over the moon. Look, there is a good chance that he might not translate to the NHL. I think that there is pretty decent boom or bust risk here, but I feel like the boom is so potent that you just have to take the swing. If there is a chance to draft one of the most exciting skaters and one of the fastest skaters in the entire class, you just have to do it. Winnipeg has had a speed and transition issue for a long time. um, And, you know, Brad can really, really motor down the ice with the puck. 
He's got a great shot. His passing when his his line mates are actually on the same page is really good. And I just think like, you know, McCrory, despite um, McCrory having really, really bad skating, they both have really good offensive instincts. Now, again, you know, Lambert's decision making not always ideal. And I think that there are quite a few things for him to focus on, especially the off the puck commitment. But (laughs) I just I really can't find anything to complain about about this pick. I think this is one of the most exciting draft picks the Jets have ever gotten. I would honestly, for me personally, say it's on the level of Perfetti excitement that I had that night when Cole was brought in. And, you know, for the Jets, kudos to you on taking the right swing. There were some other prospects who would definitely be really good options there too, like Isaac Howard, who went to Tampa Bay right after, but (laughs) I just don't see how you could pass on Brad. After knowing everything that has come out about him and the talent that he still possesses, I am definitely excited, and I think you should be too. I'd be curious to know how you feel about both prospects, though. Uh, be sure to let me know at HE Living Loco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets on Twitter and in the YouTube comments below. Tell me your thoughts on both prospects, whether you think the Jets maybe whiffed a little bit here or if you think maybe Winnipeg did a good job. And if you had alternate names that you wanted to see the Jets draft, let me know those as well. And uh, maybe I can address them in a future episode. But before we close out on tonight's episode, just after the break, I kind of want to take a little bit of a look at the rest of the draft because uh, the first round was. <sighs> It was something. I'll be honest. It was something. We'll find out why just after the jump. Hello, friends, and welcome back to these closing thoughts on tonight's episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets. We are talking about the first round of the 2022 NHL draft round uh, rounds two through seven or tomorrow or. Well, I guess if you're listening to this Friday morning, uh, it'll be in a couple of hours, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern. So stay tuned for that. But as far as the first round was concerned, Thursday was just pure chaos. It's a first round unlike anything I think we've ever seen. And there is <laughs> there's a lot to unpack, man. I got to be honest. You know, the first real shock that I think caught people off guard was Montreal selecting uh, Jurai uh, Slavkovsky first overall. Uh, he's one of the only Slovakians ever taken this high. And right after him, you know, the New Jersey Devils had a chance to get Shane Wright. They didn't. They took Simone Nemitz, which I think also surprised a lot of people. Uh, yet another Slovakian. I think this is the first time we've ever had uh, back-to-back Slovakian first-round picks, um, especially first and second overall. After that, you know, the Yotes had the third overall, and they picked Logan Cooley, which meant that at fourth overall, Seattle just somehow lucked into Shane Wright. I don't even know how Shane Wright made it past the first couple of picks. Um, he was definitely the clear number one center of this draft. And actually, when he went up on stage, one of the funniest things I saw was he looked like he basically gave Montreal's draft table the death stare. And this is in between like having a smiling photo op with Gary Bettman. He'd immediately immediately stop smiling and then look straight at the table. So, yeah, that was really funny, uh, a little bit awkward. But you, you could tell that Wright knew that he should have been at least within the first two picks and somehow fell to fourth. And I think he's now got that really feisty chip on his shoulder to prove people wrong. He even said as much in one of his interviews. After that, the rest of the first round, like in the first like five to ten picks, it wasn't super crazy. Um, Cutter Gauthier was probably one of the bigger surprises at fifth overall, but anyone who was like a Flyers fan said they were kind of like anticipating this being the pick apparently, so I guess it wasn't really that shocking. After that, though, um, everything sort of lined up roughly speaking. It's not until you started getting into the 11 to 15 range that things got a little spicy. The Arizona Coyotes went up to the 11th pick and ended up drafting Connor Geeky. I don't know why they would do this. Uh, I think they actually traded up for this pick. Uh, And look, I think Geeky is a very good prospect, and it's clear that he will probably have a decent NHL future. But given who else was on the board, I just think that that was uh, a reach that they didn't have to go with. If you're going to trade up, you better make it worth it. And like two picks after that, Frank Nazar went to Chicago. So I I don't understand why Nazar um, wasn't taken earlier within like the first 10 picks. I think that he probably should have been. Uh, That was definitely a surprise to me. But I mean, this whole first round was pretty chaotic. Dan, you know, after the Jets were getting McGordy, then you saw uh, Leketamaki go to the Vancouver Canucks. And not long after that, you saw Kamel go to uh, the Predators. So yeah, very interesting first round. 
You might have also noticed that there was a name that hasn't been mentioned yet. Two of them actually who are Russians. One of them is Ivan Mirishnichenko, and the other is Danila Yurov. Mirishnichenko actually went to um, the Washington Capitals, and I do believe he's moving back overseas. Uh, Danila Yurov, I don't know what his plans are, but he went 24th overall to the Minnesota Wild. Minnesota also picked up Liam Urgren, and I think that that was, yeah, th- those were their only picks. But in terms of like stellar value, man, I mean, that's just for what they got in those players, so long as they're able to play in the NHL at some point. Um, well, like Ogren, there's no risk with, right? But uh, of course, Yudov has some minor risk uh, as a consideration. That's a crazy good value. I think you would be laughing to the bank getting a pick this good. Later in the draft, it, it kind of settled down. I mean, Massar went to uh, Montreal. Bystat was a little bit of a surprise to the Sharks. I thought maybe they would have taken a swing on Lambert, but thanks to um, all these teams just sort of skipping on him, Winnipeg really profited. The last really crazy pick that I think was just really inexplicable was Arizona drafting Maverick Lemaru. Lemaru is actually not that bad of a prospect, but he's kind of more in like the Logan Stanley tier. Uh, he is also six seven, so the meme kind of lives on. But you know, Lamaru, I think he's a decent prospect. He is, I think, probably a little bit more talented than Stanley was. But again, given who else was on the board, Isaac Howard, Brad, Brad Lambert, a number of other really good players like Jagger Furcus, who's still not und- or who's still undrafted right now. Yeah, bit of a swing and a miss, if I'm being honest. Oh, what a first round, man. I, I honestly, this just went so far off the, the radar for me. I don't even know what to say, but I did expect chaos and that's pretty much what we got. All I can say is go Jets, go for getting us um, two pretty darn good prospects. Uh, both of them have pretty decent ceilings. And I think Brad's ceiling in particular has the potential to be a game breaker for the Jets. So go Jets, go awesome draft. Again, tell me your thoughts at HL Living Loco and LO underscore Winnipeg Jets on Twitter or on the YouTube comments below. But for tonight's episode, that is going to be all the time that we have. Again, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for making Lockdown Jets your first listen of the day every day. Next week, I'll probably be wrapping up our rounds two through seven and trying to dive into some of these deeper picks because Winnipeg is going to have quite a few of them. And hopefully the Jets get someone pretty cool deeper down the rankings. Um, but while you're here and I have your attention, I don't want to encourage, encourage you to make your second listen Locked on NHL. Our experts give you a daily 30-minute podcast on all things NHL all year long. You can subscribe to this podcast, all the same platforms that Locked on Winnipeg Jets is available. It gives you the latest scoop on the NHL and hockey around the world. So again, we love and appreciate your support when you give us that free subscription. And as always, thanks so much for listening. Have a great night and go Jets go.